On behalf of the White Lake Area Historical Society, I would like to welcome you all to our September meeting. We have a nice meeting planned, a fun meeting planned, a full meeting planned. <laughs> And I would like to mention that our next meeting, which is scheduled for October 17, is not going to be held on the 17th, prior to a prior commitment from the Playhouse in Whitehall. We have to move our meeting to the second Thursday in October, which is October 10, because the Playhouse has a dress rehearsal going on our 17th night. And at that time, Lois Ekstrand and her team will be presenting the yearly awards. Do you want to wave? <laughs> That's Lois. She's been working hard on this for the summer. Margo has a brief announcement that she would like to give. So come on up, Margo. Yeah, the awards that Lois is going to be giving are for the historical, what do you, the historical houses in both Montague and Whitehall area, uh, with pictures and often the owners come. So quite interesting next month. Um, what I'm announcing is a cemetery tour where the people who are buried there come alive and talk to you about the history. This is down in Muskegon at Evergreen Cemetery, one of the oldest cemeteries in the area. It's October 12th and 13th, a Saturday afternoon and evening, and then a Sunday afternoon. Uh, it depends whether you want after dark tour with a little bit of spookiness, or you want you know bright sun and we hope warm weather. Um, tickets are only five dollars, so it's a real deal. And um, what I'm going to do, because I think people sitting in the front row are the bravest, I'll just st start this around. I don't have enough cards for everybody, but just pass it on and take one if you think you might like to go. Okay? We have. 25 years worth of posters that we are beginning to purge our stock from. And I'm just holding up three that are really, I think they're wonderful. Some of them are in color. All of them have a different theme over the 25 years that we have done the wooden show, boat show. And $5. This one goes back to number four, the fourth annual wooden boat show, which was in 1995. So take a minute and look not only just at the ones that are on the table, but if you have a year that you would like to investigate further, um, they should be available in the upright dispenser, for lack of a better word. Also, we have been asked to mention to our membership and all of other people of interest that the walking tour booklets that you may see at the chamber or somewhere around are now up on our website. So take note of that. And about the posters, when they're gone, they're gone. So if you've got a special year that you want to remember, try to get it tonight or possibly at the next meeting. Refreshments tonight are root beer floats and cookies. I see them back there. They will be after the meeting tonight. So as soon as we end our meeting with our speaker, head on back. And I think that's all I need to mention. Now I would like to introduce our speaker. We have worked with Dan Yakes for a number of years, Professor Dan Yakes, Professor Emeritus Dan Yakes, and he has written at least five different books. Some of them are seven, seven, seven books. And he's working on one right now where we are going to be blessed with tonight as he sh shares with us. He got his undergraduate and graduate work at Western Michigan University, and then he went on to Kansas to get his PhD. He taught at Muskegon Community College for 42 years. And he has amassed a wealth of information about our country and our county. So will you please help me welcome Professor Emeritus Dan Yakes. Well, you 
you see we have a stool up here for old people like me who need to sit down regularly. Let me give you a little background. Uh, I've been working on this current book uh, for about three years. Uh, it is, uh, tentative title is Together We Fight. It is about the White Lake area in the 20th century. The book starts out with a chapter on the 19th century where the fighting began, and it goes on through the 20th and into the 21st, uh, when the fighting has been somewhat reduced. It was basically about the uh, rivalry between the two towns, Montague and Whitehall. Don't say you don't know about it. But also, they're basically brothers or siblings because you don't mess with one without messing with the other. So if you're from Muskegon or Grand Rapids or Grand Haven or Detroit or Lansing, you pick on the one, you're gonna pick on the other, and you're gonna have some scars when it's all over. So that's the basic thesis of the book. It's a big book, gonna run 600 to 700 pages, and um, we're looking at uh, chapter nine. If you didn't get it coming in, I'm gonna sit down here. Ah, can you still hear me? Uh, it's, you're looking at chapter nine. Now this is a tentative volume. The words will not change, but the formatting will change. Uh, we don't have any footnotes in this particular version. When you format and add all these pictures and maps and doodads, something happens to the footnotes, so I've got to put them back in again. So there are footnotes that go with this. Uh, you can have them if you want them, but they're not in this. I had to kind of rush it to publication. Um, it um, has some formatting problems. As uh, Alan was telling me a little while ago, reminded me I do a lot of quoting, so uh, the quotes are normally indented a couple of spaces from right and left, but that didn't happen with these. They got messed up. So there are some weaknesses with this version, but it'll all get fixed in the final analysis. Hope to have it published by Christmas time or thereabouts. Maybe a little after, we'll see. Uh, the basic uh, model is to uh, examine the area from the point of view of many, many different topics. So we look at politics, we look at uh, industry, business, uh, we look at uh, social issues, um, all kinds of things. Uh, the most recent chapters were the hardest to write. I found it very hard talking about, uh, writing about uh, industrial pollution during the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so forth. That was hard, but um, got a lot of good editing from a, a, a good source, a good editor. Tanya Kabbalah. So let's start with uh, what you have before you. This is the uh, history of land transportation in the White Lake area. I'm going to see if my little doodad works. Did it change? Okay. Well, that, let's go back to the Rogers testing it. All right. What you have here is a, a picture of our current uh, Chamber of Commerce building back when it was still a freight uh, uh, depot for the um, Paramarket Railroad. Uh, that's all there is. It was never used as a passenger um, a depot, uh, but uh, it still provided vital service for the White Lake area for many, many years, beginning in 1926. That, that's a painting that's in the chamber uh, offices. Steve was in there one day and liked the painting, so he took a picture of it and wound up as the cover of this particular section, kind of a colorful picture. Uh, if you start reading the book, and by the way, we're gonna have a, a quiz afterwards before you, I'm, I'm just kidding you, you know, quiz. Uh, it starts out with the, the famous poem by Robert Frost about entering the woods and finding two, uh, two uh, roads, and uh, he, him deciding to follow the uh, trail that was least used. Now, both of these trails look pretty well used, but we'll, maybe fix them up to look a little bit less used. But uh, that's the, base. I mean, it's a philosophy. We all have choices to make in lives. Uh, there are two or three different metaphors you could use. Chapter one, I use a, a river as a, a way of looking at the changes in time, the twists and turns of a, 
of a river that we have to make decisions over time. Shall I go this way? Shall I go that way? The river rises, the river goes down, the river spreads out, the river sometimes has a falls. There's all kinds of things that happen to the river, just as all kinds of things happen to our, our lives. Same thing with uh, roads we travel. We make decisions, we make choices. We pay for our bad decisions, most of us. We uh, perhaps relish our, our good decisions. So it is with uh, things like railroads. You have to make decisions. You get yourself a timetable and you have to figure out how you're gonna get from here to there with the help maybe of the station agent going by the most practical road, route that you can possibly use. Again, more decisions that you have to make. Uh, so let's move on here to, I think it's not a very good map, it isn't a big enough map, but what this does is shows the major thoroughfares in the early 20th century. The major roads, as you all would know, are north-south. Uh, you can go easily to the north all the way up by railroad, all the way up to Pentwater. Uh, you can go south all the way to the uh, uh, county line, beyond that to the state line, all into Chicago, wherever you want to go after that by rail, as long as you're not real picky about where you wanted to travel. The main road, uh, in terms of a highway, was the West Michigan Pike. Two or three, four years ago, you had a, a couple of speakers here that we're promoting a book on the West Michigan Pike that was a, it's still an excellent book, still for sale if you're looking for one, but it tells the tale of the West Michigan Pike. I tried to urge them to write one on the East Michigan Pike, but they didn't seem interested. There were two pikes in Michigan, one serving the west side of the state, the other serving the east side of the state, and they both merged at Mackinac City, and then went across the bridge by ferry. Remember those days when we could go by ferry, and uh, then continued on to the Sioux. So uh, this was the West Michigan Pike, and of course it was a big deal in Michigan. I mean, they would have a Michigan Pike contest every spring. Uh, they'd gather together anybody with a Hupmobile or a Packard or anything that had an engine, and they would take that trip. Take a, took them usually six to seven days to get from Chicago to, uh, to Mackinac City by the roads of the day. You know, and you had to put up with uh, broken axles and. Uh, tires that blew out every 100 miles or so. Uh, all kinds of problems with the early automobiles. Makes you wonder how they ever became successful. But of course they did. No, do, do, this is um, uh, an early map of the rail service, and it, 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 bear with me. Uh, this is not in this book, it's in chapter one, so you're not getting that tonight. But this shows the original Chicago and West Michigan Railroad. That was the predecessor line for the Pierre Marquette in this area. And you see that all it does is it goes from the Indiana border, basically, along the west coast all the way up to Pentwater. And there it ends. And then there's a branch that goes from Muskegon over to eventually Big Rapids and some other points over there. That rail line is still there. You can follow it if you want. It's a freight line today. But that's what we have. And then, of course, the Pierre Marquette came along. That's the big railroad in Michigan, 1850, uh, 1898. And what they did was they took all of the major roads in the state, with a couple of exceptions, they didn't take the Grand Trunk, and a couple of others, and they merged them together into one big railroad. And as you can see, the problem for us in western Michigan is that this little line was just a minor branch line. It only goes as far as Pentwater. So if you want to go to Pentwater, that's a wonderful thing. But you can't get from there to Ludington, and you can't get from there to Manistee. You basically have to go back to Muskegon, and maybe you could get a line over to Big Rapids if you wanted to. But you can't even get to Grand Rapids from here. Um, you got to go all the way down to basically Holland and take another line. Well, you could take the Grand Trunk out of Muskegon to get to Grand Rapids, but you couldn't go there on the Pierre Marquette. Now, you all, I think, should have a uh, copy of one of their timetables. I'm just using up old stock, all right? So you don't get anything special from me, but you should have one of two timetables. Uh, I have one here that's from 1918 about two, about 100 years ago. And on mine, I'm sorry, 
Um, the road we're looking, this is not 1914, I beg your pardon. Uh, so if we want to find our local line, go down here in the middle, and that's the Allegan and Muskegon and Pentwater Railroad. And so you can see all the different lines that uh, were coming from the north and coming from the south. If you have the 1918 version, uh, the appropriate portion is over here on the left-hand side, about uh, two-thirds of the way down. I don't know if you uh, have that one, but it's over there. It's basically the same thing. Why do we have two? Well, 1914, the railroad was on its own. By 1918, the country was in, embroiled in World War I, which, if you're not aware, was a, a time of extreme federal power, power grab, basically. You better not be a German. Uh, during World War I, my family was. <laughs> they changed their name <laughs> in order to cope, added an S to their name to make it sound more English than uh, German. So at any rate, uh, the, the federal government took control of all the railroads in the country and, con and altered the schedules of all of them under the grounds of uh, national defense and national integrity and all that sort of thing. You never know when some of these German bums might you know, take control of these railroads and sabotage them and all of that stuff. Not, none of that ever happened, but that was the scare that was going around. Better not be a communist either, or a homosexual, or a Negro, or whatever, I mean, the language of the time. So, uh, t take a look at that. Uh, I think it says at the top, doesn't it, you can't get there from here. I, no, I, I, I can't see that far. I'm going to put my glasses on. Well, I won't worry about it. Um, Let's move on to the, I have to put my glasses on now. Uh, every train, uh, every t train uh, railroad company had its own set of designs for its uh, stations. Uh, they had maybe a dozen different designs. Some of them, of course, could only be put in large cities like uh, Detroit or uh, Grand Rapids or Flinder, places like that. Uh, others, of course, were quite small. Now, this is a fairly grandiose looking depot, they call them depots, not stations, uh, in Holland, and quite, quite grand. Of course, Holland was an important res uh, res resort area, just as um, uh, Muskegon and White Lake were, and so that's part of the reason for the large number of people. But uh, they're also getting, of course, a lot of other traffic locally. Uh, here's another better example. That's the new era station. <laughs> Hardly enough room in there to turn around. But they didn't have a lot of business, of course. This is basically potato country, and they were producing uh, other crops, uh, cherries and apples and peaches and so forth. But it was only busy a portion of the year because those crops only come in in the fall. So they didn't have to have a big station. Here's the original, uh, well, I think it's the original Whitehall station. It was a passenger and freight station. That's a famous picture, a lot of them around. It's at the foot of Slocum, uh, along Lake Street in, uh, in Whitehall. You see the water tower? They had to have a water tower uh, to their steam engine, so they have to put in water to get them across the bridge. Uh, they didn't have a water tower, as far as I know, in Montague, but they did have one here. Uh, here's another, pardon me, I went a little too far. Here's another view of that same station. You can see the hill behind it here with some people waiting to get on the train. Again, it's a small locomotive. That's, those are important nuances to look at. Uh, and again, that's what you're going to find on this rail. They didn't, the company did nothing uh, to improve the rail line. This is basically what the Chicago and West Michigan had used. They have the same, uh, tracks, they have the same ballasting, so they couldn't put a, a big locomotive in a big train. They didn't get a lot of business, mostly passenger business, except in the fall when they had these big crops of uh, fruit and other commodities coming in and out. Most of our local in industries didn't ship uh, by, by this means. They were probably using the uh, Goodrich line, which was a competitor to the railroad. Uh, so there's the station in Whitehall. Here's the only picture I have come upon in, of the station in Montague. It looks a little bigger than the uh, station in Whitehall, passenger station also. Uh, in this case, for some reason, the uh, fire department had decided to, they had uniforms back in those days. What? I mean, this is sort of the professional issue. They considered themselves professionals. So if you were a policeman, if you were a fireman, 
Even miners dressed in suits when they went mining, and believe it or not, because this is a sign of their success in, in their careers. Uh, you wouldn't see these things on the volunteer farm today. I think they're not very practical. But uh, there's the station. It was uh, at the end of Spring Street. Uh, the site is still there. I mean, it's right along the rail trail, but there's no evidence of the, of the station itself as far as I know. Both of those stations uh, went out of business in 1926 when the Paramarquette ceased uh, servicing the White Lake area. Nothing north of Muskegon uh, would carry passengers after that. I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, here is the uh, type of locomotive they would have used. That's a small, this is a Lima, L-I-M-A, Lima uh, Locomotive Works in Lima, Ohio. Small engine, to put, but again, because of the roadbed and, and the poor quality, um, they had to run these smaller uh, locomotives. And they only have a few cars, typically. Now, this is what they use later on. Am I seeing it right? Oh. No, same one. Sorry, I can't see. The, all right, this is a Baldwin. Uh, they're much bigger, as you can see. They didn't start using those until the late, seven, late uh, uh, 30s, 37, 38. Some of them are still around. You can still take uh, rail trips on them because they held up pretty well. But a, a, a big locomotive like that, of course, was not very practical around here because they tended to spread the rails. They're so big and heavy, and the rails were so poorly uh, connected uh, to, to the uh, roadbed that they, they would damage the, the rail. They'd have to rebuild the whole thing, which they eventually did. But um, it was a big expense for the company. Now, this gives you some idea of the disasters that would uh, reflect. Almost every year you'd have some disaster. Maybe it was a snow drift that clogged the line. This is the uh, famous uh, uh, tunnel over in Whitehall. It still causes problems today. I just hate that curve, even though it's been remodeled, what, eight, ten times? I don't know. But they had this, this big rainstorm back in 1910. And it, uh, the rain came down and it spread on both sides of the uh, tunnel and it wiped out the tunnel and filled it with all kinds of dirt and debris and crap. You can see a little riv river flowing down there where the rail line used to be. Even in good times, the conductors would stop every time they went through just to check it to make sure the boards weren't gonna fall loose or something wasn't gonna damage the truck or the, tr the, the train or the locomotive. So this is the beginning, and of course we have a succession. These are all from the Montague Museum. They prop up the sides to um, make sure everything is sound, and they fixed it up on the inside, took those boards off again. Did, what, did I go too far? Well, I got the, I went too far. Well, I guess I, I thought I had four of them in here, but I'm mistaken. Here's another example of a derailment. Uh, this is somewhere around St. Joe, it's the same line, the same line went through St. Joe. And you see the whole train has been forced off the track. Again, you, you can imagine, in these days, they didn't have electrified cars. The only lighting was from kerosene lamps. So you can imagine what would happen, and if it was the winter time, they'd have a, a coal fire heater. And so you tip over like that, what's going to happen to the kerosene and the uh, fuel and you're probably going to kill a bunch of people. Um, the company got sued all the time from people who were injured or their baggage was destroyed. Here's another, ex oh, it just got out of order, pardon me. I thought I fixed that. This is another example of the tunnel, again, showing a locomotive trying to bring repairs. They've, they've dumped a bunch of the uh, eroded material into that, uh, uh, where the coal should be. And uh, here's an another example of them opening up the uh, tunnel. Sorry about that. Here's uh, that picture of uh, St. Joe derailment. Here's another, this is my favorite. This is uh, Happy Creek. Does anybody know where Happy Creek is? Happy Creek is between New Era and Shelby. And you can see another storm came along, wiped out the entire um, embankment there where the railroad used to be. You, I mean, these men are standing up there on the rail. The rail is still attached to the ties, but uh, there ain't nothing under there except here. So imagine how long it would have taken to repair that. That's the only line. 
I mean, they'd have to close down the whole rail line for two or three days probably before they could repair all that stuff. So that gives you some example, uh, some, uh, some idea of the terrible situation. Now, eventually, the, as I say, the passenger service ended uh, in 1926. Now, locally, if you were in the summertime, you could still get a passenger service out of here if you took uh, one of the uh, steamships. We still had the Goodrich line, was still operating, and uh, you could at least get from here to Muskegon, perhaps, or you could get ferries to Pentwater or other places if you wanted to, and that would have been a nice trip. But of course, once the season ended, you wouldn't be able to go out in the wintertime. So you're pretty much stuck with roads. Now this is a good example of the roads that existed prior to the pike. Pike comes in about 1914 or 15 thereabouts. Uh, this is the dirt road, and uh, it's not very comforting. I mean, the trees grow practically onto the road. There's only one lane. What do you do if somebody's coming toward you with a truck or a team of horses or who knows what? And uh, you're going to have to do some backpedaling, probably. So that's the situation. Now, people did get around on bicycles. This is the White Lake Bicycle Club, I think it says. Uh, it looks like it's uh, Ripley's, uh, that's what used to be uh, Lipka's uh, drugstore in, uh, what is now Lipka's, it used to be Ripley's in Montague. But, I mean, they could go great distances on bad roads. The, the, the bikes weren't as good as they are today, but uh, that was about the only way around unless you wanted to walk. And even the ladies, this is a really nice picture. It's from the Montague Museum. Muske uh, Montague Bell. Imagine pedaling your bike with that skirt. Uh, I get my cuffs caught up in the gears, and I'm just wearing cuffs, you know. Shorts be better. Uh, but that skirt, I, I, she wouldn't be able to get more than a block, wouldn't she? Would she? Unless she really hikes it up. But uh, again, that was the way you got around. She's a pretty girl, too. Uh, now, in comes the, Muske the West Michigan Pike. Different stories about it, but my version of the truth is that it started in Muskegon with uh, our county uh, commission uh, trying to build a road that would connect along the shoreline. Other versions have it starting in Grand Rapids and such, but uh, I think our version is better. Uh, along the way, this was one of the signs that they would put up along the way. They're made uh, usually of metal, and they would post them every mile or so. The trouble was that the road kept twisting and turning all the time, so uh, every time it turned, they'd have to put another sign up in indicating turn right, turn left, go ahead. And uh, some people like to shoot at them, so you can't imagine anybody doing that, can you? Uh, destroying them, sometimes stealing the signs because they wanted something for the wall or whatever. So this gives you, and this is in the book, you might want to refer to that. Uh, this is how you navigated a long trip. This shows the pike from roughly uh, uh, south of Muskegon. I think it goes down to, I don't have to look. I can't, I can't read from here. It goes a long way down. And it, it, it brings us up to Montague and Whitehall. And you see it's making all kinds of twists and turns. Why is that? Well, eminent domain. You see, nobody wanted, they had farms. They had property. And if the state wanted to build it straight to go, say, from the head of Muskegon Lake to the head of White Lake, that's an angle. And that would mean they'd have to cross a bunch of people's property. And they'd have to get their permission. They'd have to pay the money. And who's going to do that? So they follow the section lines between farms. They'll go north for a couple miles, and they'll go east for a couple miles, and they'll go west for a couple miles, and, and so forth. They wouldn't do that east and west, they would go north, south. And, and so they kind of jig jag along the way, and every time they make a turn, of course, they don't bother to bank it or anything like that, so they just make a turn. And they probably, they'll probably have some marker there, like a church or a cemetery or a school or old Rube's house or whatever it is, and they'll mark that on the map uh, along the, uh, the directions there and tell you turn left here, and then you go another two miles or something like that, and you turn north again, and that's how you found your way, assuming you didn't have a flat tire or something like that. So that's the road from the south up to White Lake. 
as you go north, then you have these other, I think that one goes up to Manistee. So there's a story in this chapter about this family from Kalamazoo or somewhere, uh, trying to get up to um, uh, Pentwater, no, Ludington. They, they had a cottage on uh, Hamlin Lake. And they have two flat tires along the way, and it took them two days to get there. They stopped over in, uh, I don't know, around uh, Grand Haven the first time, and then they made the rest of it. It took them the rest of the day, a whole day, to get from Grand Haven to uh, Manistee. Uh, again, they didn't have to stop for dinner. They, they, they got north of Montague, and the, the, the signs were indistinct. So they stopped and talked to this old man cavorting with children out there. Now, I wonder who that was. And what were they doing cavorting in the woods? I, I don't know. But uh, he gave them the wrong information, and so they lost another hour that way. So they finally got up to their destination after dark and had to sort of poke their way around, finding their way. This, I mean, gives you a good idea of what life was like. You want to go back to the good old days? Think about outhouses. Think about scrubbing the floors on your hands and knees. That's what I think about. All right, here's part of the pipe. Now, you may, let, may look familiar to you. Roger, you would know that, I think. That's the causeway between North Muskegon and uh, Muskegon. Uh, before the uh, uh, Miracle Mile was built, they had these trees along the way, and it's basically a two-lane road. That's really a nice piece of road for the pike for that time. Usually, this is a, an area near Lakewood Club, uh, south of Whitehall. It's a one-lane road there. They, they, it's sort of paved in the middle, and then it's gravel on both sides. So basically, if somebody's coming up behind you, uh, you you got to get over to the right, and they'll pass you partly on the gravel, partly on the pavement. Somebody's coming toward you, particularly a truck, you'd better move over uh, because they're going to probably wipe you out. There's only one lane of traffic, and, and that's all they could afford, and that's all they figured they would need. So here's another example. Um, that's a, uh, again, that's the same kind of a thing, a single lane. That's north of Montague. That's up near uh, Camp Aloha, it was called, which I think was somewhere around, uh, it's, it's on what's US, old US 31. Um, it would be up around, uh, oh, the, uh, there's a car dealership up there now. That's, uh, I think it's on the other side from that. But anybody remember Camp Aloha? Minor Park Road. Minor Park, so it's, I'm, I'm roughly pretty close. That's Minor Park Road, isn't it? That goes across there? Fruitvale. Fruitvale, I'll say. So, so it's, mine, it's another mile up further. So it's almost to the county line, I take it. Okay, I'll put that in the book. Thank you very much. Shall I put a citation for you? With the, all, right, all right, good. All right, good. Uh, now here again, this is the road up at Frankfurt. As you went further north, the road got worse and worse and worse. And uh, they paved the parts that were best traveled uh, in the south because the traffic's coming mostly from the Chicago and Illinois area, in Indiana. And so this shows the road up north of Frankfurt. And uh, as you see, it's really just down to a single lane and not even uh, uh, much room for passing there. Now, many of us remember going along these roads and stopping every, depends on how hungry the kids were, but you'd stop quite frequently in the fall, particularly for these roadside stands. So, I mean, that's how a lot of these farmers made their livings. They would, of course, market their product uh, to a cannery or somebody else, but they also sold at the, at the, now you can still find places like this. I bought some asparagus at a place like that this spring. And my wife buys corn and other stuff locally at places like this. But there aren't very many left. And that's, that's, I mean, that broke up the trip. I mean, when you got kids, you have to plan stops like this just for the kids to get out and run, run around, do things, and maybe get some fruit. Now, in comes the Greyhound. Uh, Greyhound, of course, was the big successful bus company, but there were many bus companies back in days of yore. Uh, this is one of their early buses. Uh, they first come to Muskegon County in 1925. And that gave the uh, railroad an excuse to quit running passenger traffic. Uh, most of the rail lines in Michigan and throughout most of the North 
were land grant railroads. In other words, they got free land to build the road through a certain area, and mostly they spent that, or in this case, the owners of the company uh, acquired much of it and didn't put it back into the company. And uh, in return, the, uh, the railroad had to agree to carry the mail. It had to agree to uh, uh, allow state and government officials to travel free of charge and so forth. So it was an expenditure and they had to promise to carry the passengers. Uh, but once the Greyhound arrived, of course, they don't, didn't have that obligation any longer. So as soon as the Greyhound appeared, uh, a year later, passenger service ended uh, locally. Now again, locally, you still had the Goodrich line that could help you out in the summer for passenger and freight traffic, but that also ceased in the early depression of 1931. So uh, Greyhound was the way to, to get from place to place. Now they had, uh, I didn't bring them with me, but uh, they also had uh, uh, timetables. I have one right here, I didn't, here's another one. Uh, both towns had what I'm going to call depots. They really weren't depots. They were local places where you could go and pick up the rail line. I don't know. I think they were somebody else's business. I imagine the Franklin House had one. Uh, there's probably a drugstore or something like that in Whitehall that passengers could get tickets. Uh, I mean, there wasn't all that much business, but they modeled themselves on the railroad, so they developed cruisers like this. Now, that was the epitome of travel by Greyhound back in the 30s. That's a scene in Muskegon. Uh, they had lounge chairs, they had bathrooms. You know, you could take a nap along the way, enjoy the scenery until the tires blew out or something like that. But uh, minor problems, all right. Now the other thing that we wanna look at in terms of, of uh, local uh, automobile and truck traffic are the gas stations. Uh, nowadays, of course, uh, there's only a few of them around and they're all franchise operations, Wesco's or Admiral's or something like that. Back then, all the stations were locally owned and they all had at least two pumps. They all provided all kinds of services. They repair tires, they'd fix your radiator. They would actually come out and clean your windshield if you had one and uh, they'd pump the gas for you. You see this guy is, uh, prepared. I mean, gasoline is selling for 15 cents a gallon, so he's got to have a coin changer to uh, make change. I remember my dad would go in and I'll have a dollar's worth. Dollar's worth? <laughs> Imagine going into a gas station and getting a dollar's worth of gas today. Well, you know, back then that'd be six gallons or so. And uh, so we had 16 gas stations in the Whitehall Montague uh, Village Limits at one time. Uh, all locally owned and pretty much like this one was on uh, in Montague right near the curve uh, that takes you from what now is called Dowling and you make the curve on to Water Street uh, there were three stations right along and they're all next to one another that's why they could charge they charge so little they were in competition with one another one station lowers its rate for by, by a penny <laughs> the guy next door has to do the same thing if he's going to get any business you see, so competitive. All right, this is uh, another type of station. I don't have a good picture of the, uh, what's called the Pike uh, Garage. It's that building at the far right, it's still there. Uh, it's used by, I think, a pool company, uh, the, not the pool with the pool cues, but uh, they do pool equipment and so forth. That's the old Pike Garage. And uh, they sold cars, they were selling Fords, but m many of these stations also had a dealership. There were five different dealerships in the Montague and White Lake area, Montague and Whitehall area at that time, that being one of them. Now again, the next we need to talk about roads and causeways. This is a crew of workers back about 1910, laying down piles for the causeway connecting the two towns. Now, you're well aware that's all swampland through there. And they were filling it in with uh, debris from the lumber mills and old logs and scraps and such and dirt and sand. There used to be a lot of little lagoons along in there. There's not much left of that anymore. It's one sort of behind uh, Dog and Suds. It's sort of a remnant of that. But they had to lay down all these heavy pilings in order to provide something that you, you could fasten uh, dirt and and other 
components of, of the causeway. And so they're laying that down. If you want to read about that, uh, Lex Chisholm had an article about that back in the Muskegon Chronicle. Uh, you have to go to the microfilm version to get it, but uh, been dead quite a long time. But it, it, it was, as, a, as a kid, he was about 10 years old, his uncle ran a livery service and he would go along with his uncle as they were laying down the dirt for this. They had a wagon and the wagon had a bed and in the bed were boards and they'd fill it up with gravel and dirt and crud and then they'd pull the plank out and it would all dump onto the road service and they'd go back and hitch up another wagon and do the same thing day after day after day. That was his fun for the summertime. Sounds like fun to me too. Now this is an early, it's not that early, it's about 1960. Many of you would will remember the city as it was then. Uh, that's Montague and you can see that the road comes across from the right and then will take a turn to the north. That's not the original route of the Pike, however. The original route went through downtown, they called it uh, at that time Bridge Street, and then it went roughly west, and then all the way out to Route 99, or Old 99. That was the route that you would take north up until 1921. What changed was the state built a concrete road from Montague all the way to New Era, and so everybody took that road. Of course, it was straight. You didn't have to worry about getting lost in the woods or cavorting with 10 children or anything like that. Uh, you just uh, went that, and of course, that's the way the road goes today. It's old 31, basically. Uh, this, again, about that same time, they improved the road. The original bridge, as some of you may have heard, I don't think anybody goes back that far uh, in, in times of in ter in time. The original bridge was a swinging bridge. Uh, they had to have it that way because they had, when it was built, they had logs in the river and uh, they would keep one side free. The logs would come through the one side and you could navigate sort of on the other side of the river. And so the river actually swung. Uh, you could get on it. Uh, John Lloyd was, his father lived around here about that time. This farmer had come over from Whitehall, was going to Montague, stopped to talk to some uh, the tender in the middle. And of course, nobody around here ever stops in the middle of the road to talk to uh, somebody else, uh, never happens. But uh, they did that kind of thing back then. And uh, he was talking away and the boat came through and turned the, the, uh, the bridge around. And they started talking again and John's father kept moving and he wound up back in Whitehall. We can, <laughs> they turned it all the 180 degrees around and he hadn't been paying attention. So it was a troublesome thing. But this is the Camelback Bridge. A lot of people remember that. Built in 1924 no longer standing, and that was how you got across the bridge back in them their days. Now these are the early roads, that's Mears over in Whitehall, main drag, uh, and that's how it looked about 1910. And of course that's after it has been uh, leveled a bit, you know, and they scrape it every spring, call it good, uh, but that's the road. Uh, this of course is an example of uh, the, uh, of, they called it Lake Street back in those days. That's right about at the mill pond, and you can see that it's uh, uh, pretty bleak looking, unpaved. That's not far from my home. Now here again, they're, they're going to start repairing. This is the better equipment they had. This at least is a truck and 10 men with, sh with shovels. Nobody doing any work, of course, but uh, they're actually standing around getting ready to do some work, I suppose. Uh, again, uh, sometimes they used teams of horses. This is Old Channel Trail uh, being constructed. Imagine having to dig away at that sand dune just to get past it. And uh, here again is the paved Old Channel Trail. That's uh, Coon Creek. Uh, it's not very far from here, but this is after it was paved. It was called Prospect Street back in those days. Once you got across the bridge, it became Lake Street. But of course, it was also Lake Street in Whitehall. And of course, they eventually changed the name to Old Channel Trail. When they paved it, uh, this was back in 1922 or so, they had a big contest to name it. And the winner was uh, Dolly, uh, uh, Dolly, uh, you tell me, no, 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 before her, your relative, uh, uh, Connell. Fair, fair, oh, Connell, right. 
uh, she was a school teacher at the Maple, um, uh, what do you call it, Maple Grove School, which was right along here, and uh, she named it Old Channel Trail. And of course, she got nothing but abuse for it. She won $10 for that. And uh, well, who could come up with such a stupid name as Old Channel Trail? First of all, it's too long. First of all, and it don't say nothing. It's, it just tells you where it's going. And nobody knows where that is anyway. You see, so, well, I'm kind of glad. I lived on Old Channel Trail for a long, long time. I really liked the name. But I didn't live back in 1923 either, so. There you go. Uh, now again, this is, I think, the last slide. Uh, by the early 20s, you had paved roads on both sides of the lake. So that's about 14 miles of paved roads. Uh, and it was fine unless you happened to be at Old Channel Inn or something like that, and you wanted desperately to get over to Murray's Inn, which was only about half a mile away, but there was this big channel that caused you problems. So uh, what's, what the D Diamond Brothers did was to uh, develop this uh, tra uh, trails meet ferry. And it's uh, only operated in the summer. And uh, you could get on on one side and cross over by cable. They had a, a motor that followed a cable that was under the water and uh, bring you over to the other side, about two minutes. They charged by the uh, axle number of axles and the number of passengers. So of course, some of our, you can't imagine many local people being cheap, but quite a few were. So they'd, they'd stick the kids in the rumple seat or in the trunk or something like that, and they'd cross over, and you only have to pay for two people that way, you see, mom and dad. And then they'd clamber on out when they got to the other side. So this operated in the uh, late spring, early summer, under the fall. And it was really very popular. You can see there are people lining up to get on. And uh, we've had programs here on, on, the, on the trail, but it, it makes a difference if you can tie it into other things as I've tried to do here. All right, I think that's it. Yeah. Am I okay for time? No, well, that's it. But I, I'll be happy to answer questions about uh, tra transportation, anything you want. I, Get me now, because in a year or two, I'll be on to the medical history of Muskegon County, and that's all I'll know. See, I gotta empty my brain of everything I know in order to make room for the new stuff. So if you have questions about any aspect of local history, let me know, because this may be your last chance. Yes, and I can't see who you are, but... Margo. Margo, yes. I just wanted to mention that one of our posters is the Trails Meet. Yeah, that's it. And it has... Um, Going across mm -hmm. and a family, and the family has an African American nanny holding. Oh, yeah, that happened a lot at Sylvan Beach and Michelinda. They often employed uh, people from Chicago to uh, take care of their children in the summertime. And uh, these folks, I think, were very happy to be able to get, I mean, the, the, the na nannies and the butlers and chauffeurs, probably very happy to get away from Chicago because they're getting paid to come. Granted, they're going to have to work the whole summer, but they would in any way, and here again they get to work at a place with a beach and and uh, good meals and friendly neighbors and so forth. Yeah, yes, Margo. The other thing I wanted to mention, you mentioned the Goodrich Line, yes. you like the people who don't know what that was. Or that was the major steamship line in the uh, West Michigan area, but it wasn't the only one. Again, in this competitive mode, both towns craved th that kind of traffic. So Goodrich established uh, three um, uh, docks, in the White, all on the Whitehall side, of course. So they had Sylvan Beach, they had one at Michelinda, which is basically Lakeside Inn today, and they had one at the head of the lake uh, around Goodrich Park, and none on the Montague side. So, of course, we can't stand that. So Montague contracted with a company called the People's Transit Company, which was a subsidiary of the Graham and Morton line. That was the major competitor. Uh, they, that company operated mostly from, oh, roughly Holland on south. Their traffic was mostly with Chicago and with uh, Milwaukee. And, but they had this subsidiary that came in and started doing business with uh, Montague. And they built a pavilion. We, we have pictures of it. You probably have seen it. It was about where the... Uh, Old City Hall used to be, uh, the, the bank was in there for a while. There's a, another business 
right at right on the Montague side, just barely on the Montague side of the channel of the river. That was where the pavilion was located. And they operated ferries out of there and these big vessels came in there every, every year uh, for many, many, uh, throughout the summer, uh, competing with, uh, with uh, the Goodrich Line. That company eventually went out of business and largely because coming up that far for a big ship required tremendous dredging of the river all the time, of the lake. And so eventually, both the Goodrich vessels and the People's Transit Company had to abandon those sites. And they reestablished another site at Harvey's Dock. That's the Montague Bathing Beach area um, that we know today. It had a big dock there. It's where the, the, the um, Gold Cup races were held back in 1926. That was Harvey's Dock. And so Montague did get the business eventually, but only because Nobody wanted to spend the money to dredge the lake, see, so it took things like that for Montague to be victorious sometimes. In terms of the uh, lake itself, we tend to think of the whole lake as a resort area, but most of the resorts were on the south side and, and uh, on the west. The north side only had a few, the Cherokee, which burned down, and a few small ones in Montague. But the north side was mostly oriented toward farming and uh, fishing, commercial fishing. There were no commercial ventures on the south side and not much farming uh, south of Whitehall. The big farming areas were Claybanks Township and White River, Montague Township and so forth. Yes, sir. Yeah, Dan, I, I, maybe I'd like to say something about the Goodrich Lines. Yeah. Like, uh, you watch, there's a whole section of the Goodrich Lines. Yes. In the book. Yes. And so the question he, he reviewed it, I'm sorry. Can, can we get you up next year for a talk on the Goodrich we will do whatever the commission wants. We should have it ready. I mean, we're talking right now. Um, Steve is always anxious to put color in these books, but that's expensive. That doubles the cost of the book. But we may very well be able to publish one chapter or two chapters in color. I mean, we can do that. As long as their books are put together in signatures, they're called. In this case, there are 16 pages. And if you can get everything you want into 16 pages, you can do that in color. Now that chapter is going to run about 40 pages, so we'll have to do maybe three signatures, but we can afford that maybe. Maybe not, I don't know, we've got limited resources. But uh, uh, yes, we'll try to, but if the uh, society wants good, I almost decided to do that, this one, but it, I, I couldn't do two chapters, it just was too much to put in. And even this one is not finished. Yes, if you want, we can do that next year. It's a good example of competition between the two towns. Question over here, I saw. I wondered when they tore down the Camelback Bridge. Oh, that was uh, 86 or something like that? And why? I've never seen a bridge before in my life where each side is different. Oh, well. I don't know. Uh, Roger, were you on the city commission then? You probably didn't even live in town. Uh, I don't know. Tom, were you paying attention to that kind of thing back then? Where's Tom? I don't know why they decided. I mean, the bridge was in bad shape. I do remember that. Uh, it had, uh, as I remember, lanterns at each end, and they had all been broken. Probably some thugs from Whitehall came over and, <laughs> and uh, hit them. I mean, I'm just, I don't know. If, you, if I were in Whitehall, I'd reverse it and say it was Montague. But, uh, you know, a lot of vandalism on the bridge. And, and the water had been high, too. I mean, there were other times before this year that the water was high. So there were many times when they had to elevate the level of the road in order to get above the lake. So lots of excuses to build a better bridge. But I don't know why. I think it was 86 that that was done. It wasn't all that long ago. It's a state highway. What's it again? A state highway. Oh, OK. Fake highway. OK. Fake, F-A-K-E, okay. State of Michigan. Oh, oh, I see, all right. A little humor that escaped me, so. Uh, all right, I had, I had all kinds of cemetery jokes, too. All right, Alan, I can see you. When they start paving these roads, what did they use to... Well, yeah, I was going to talk about that. The South Shore, they used uh, they called Willite. W-I-L-L-I-T-E. It's a combination of cupric something or other and gravel and basically a form of asbestos. They laid it down two inches thick, a whole two inches thick on a sand base. 
And you can imagine how well it held up. Uh, the, the, the end of uh, what would it, we would call today uh, Mears, where it crosses the creek there, that's now Zeller Road. Back then they called that the Tarvia Road because that's another brand of asphalt that uh, they used. On the Michelinda Road, they call that the Stone Road. Again, that was built a lot of money from Michelinda, state money and association funding. Uh, there wasn't anybody living along the road much at that time, a couple farmers. So Michelinda paid about 40% of the cost, the, the association members, and they built it out of stone. It's almost narrow, it's almost straight, uh, per perfectly straight. Uh, a few little, little hills, I mean, just minor uplifts along the ways through a swamp. I mean, there's swampy areas along in there. That was built with stone. I don't remember, it was a form of asphalt used on Whole Channel Trail, but I don't remember the name that they used for that. Again, uh, Old Channel Trail, it wasn't all called Old Channel Trail at first. The part in, in Montague was called Prospect Street. Um, called that because it was the road to Prospect Point. Prospect Point was what we now call Indian Point. So again, they're using the concept of where does the road go to name the road. It makes a lot of sense to me, rather than somebody's name or, you know, well, we've got a lot of roads like that, but the person that's named for is dead. You know, so we used to have a lot of roads like that. We don't have them anymore. So I'm glad about that, that family's gone, so we're not really injuring anybody's heritage or anything like that. Nice to know that that's where the road goes. And if you're on it, you're not familiar with the road, or it goes to Old Channel, and that's nice. So uh, they use different kinds of asphalt. That's the cheapest form of improvement above what they called, uh, uh, what's the other name? Uh, Mc, uh, there's a Macadam. That's sort of a stone surface that uh, they all have crowns. You're trying to give me a crown. So they want their water to run off to one side or the other uh, to keep it going. So that was another form of paving. Uh, not much in the way of concrete. The, the only concrete road around here was the road from Montague to New Era took a long time. I mean, that's expensive to build a road like that. But again, probably because of the farm traffic, you're getting a lot of traffic. You see, we forget about the farmers around here. Um, that was big business. The best farmlands were up in Oceana County and then Montague and White River. And so the, their problem was getting the, the items to market. And that's why Montague got into the act to build a pavilion, because they had a deal with this fellow from Shelby, who said he sent all of the business down to Montague, if only they would build the pavilion and a little spur line from the railroad. So uh, they agreed to do that. Montague actually paid, the voters voted for this, to build that spur line and the pavilion. Tax money, they voted to do that. And then this guy from Shelby, Llewellyn, used it for only one year, and then he took his business to Muskegon. See, this is why you hate Muskegon around here, you know? And Shelby, too, for that matter. But, uh, you know, they got screwed, basically. Uh, and again, Montague lost out to Whitehall, too, of course, you know? So a lot of business was, uh, was built around farming and, and these farm crops that would come on, too. So that makes sense to build a concrete road uh, because you're carrying all this heavy... Uh, commerce that, that is going in, perhaps uh, equipment that goes back to the farms too for more crops next year. So qu other questions? It all fits together. That's part of the historian's problem, trying to fit it all together and make sense out of it. People didn't just do things because they wanted to, they just did it because it made sense. It tied into something else that was sensible. Margo. Is there an awful lot of Civil War generals Yes. Around yes. this area. The roads named none, for them. None for the south. Well, no, why would you? I mean, we have a few examples in the, uh, uh, I think, Oak, Oak uh, what's the, what's the, uh, Oak Oak well, no, I mean the one in, in uh, you're going to visit in, in Muskegon. There's a couple of Confederates. Evergreen. Evergreen. There are a couple of Confederates in there, but they basically had to pay to get in. I mean, <laughs> these are sacred grounds. This is how they look at it. Here in Montague, if you're Catholic, you're in your own cemetery. 
If you're Protestant, you're in your own cemetery. You, you, you couldn't get away with burying a, a, a non-Christian in a Protestant secretary, a cemetery or, or, or a Protestant in a Catholic cemetery. It just wouldn't be allowed. Um, so these are important. These are differences in values. We try not to judge the values of 100 years ago by our standards today. They've changed. But uh, at least we can recognize that they were different. So again, they're not going to name anything locally. Remember, who's running the government? Which party do you think was running the government locally and in Michigan? That's called the Republican Party. How did they gain power? In large part because of the bloody shirt. They blamed their enemies, the Democrats, for causing the Civil War. Those Southerners were all Democrats. And these Northerners were a bunch of copperheads that were doing the same thing, except through subterfuge. And if you're a good American, good Republican, you don't name anything after any damn long street or Lee or maybe a different Lee or a Lee who wasn't part of the Confederacy. You sure didn't name anything after these bums. They're all criminals. They're all traitors. <laughs> So why would you do that? You know, and again, I'm not, I'm just putting emphasis on it because if that's how they looked at it at the time. Those were the values they had. There are going to be people in 50 years or so arguing back on us and so on. What are those dummies back in, 19, in 2020, 2019? Why did they do that? That's stupid. You know? But we'll do what we have to do, I guess. We'll just have to survive. Yeah, Roger. Also, Dan, in response to that, I mean, we're in the Memorial. Exactly. No affairs. Exactly. At Gettysburg. And they're, you know, in Sheridan, Custer. He, yes, exactly. Custer was from Monroe. But Southern General. Uh, yeah, they're, they're basically uh, using names that have identification with local people. Uh, the ferry was in the 5th Cavalry. The 5th Cavalry was in a brigade uh, called the Michigan Brigade. And so Custer was the uh, brigade uh, uh, general. That's why he called a brigadier general, because general, general over a brigade. So he gets recognized. Other people uh, were uh, leading generals on the Union side in which the local uh, soldiers fought. So they're naming someone after. I mean, keep in mind, the, the White Lake chapter of the GAR was the fifth GAR in the whole state of Michigan, number five. Number five out of like 200. Muskegon was number two. Uh, maybe I got them backwards, but uh, there were two of the original ones in the state of Michigan. GAR stands for Grand Army of the Republic, but their opponents always said they're generally all Republicans. They weren't. Uh, that's just a joke, but uh, a lot of them were Democrats. But the party did support Republicans almost exclusively in terms of state and national elections. And the state was gerrymandered in favor of Republican Party uh, through mainly the... Uh, called the, uh, um, running out of time, huh? uh, the, the, uh, through the uh, a moiety system. In Michigan, up until the, our current con constitution uh, of, of, of 1963, every, we had 100, um, congression, 100 state legislative districts, 100. We had 83 counties. And under our state constitution, if a county had more than one half of 1% of the population of the state of Michigan, it was entitled to its own member of the state legislature. So they went through and picked out all the counties that had more than 1%, moiety is one half in French. Uh, they gave all of those counties their own state rep. Of course, they wanted their own rep. So that left about seven uh, maybe eight or nine uh, left over, and and uh, because some counties would get two, Muskegon always had two, and uh, other bigger counties would get more, and that always left about six or seven for Detroit. So even though by the 18, 1940s Detroit represented 40 percent of the population of the state of Michigan, they got about 17 percent of the seats in the House of Representatives, in the state, state legislature. Not fair, but that was the right thing to do according to our local Republican leaders. Uh, I would say not fair, but uh, I didn't live back then. 80, 42, I was around, or not 40. So the state was pretty much organized by the Republican Party up through the early 30s. 
And of course, that's when the uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president. He had, we call them long coattails. So he was able to drag in uh, a few Democrats to uh, public office. We elected a Democrat as our congressman the last time, 1932. It's been since 1932 we had a Democrat as a state congressman from around here. Uh, I have a whole chapter on politics, by the way. I, I, I try to be even-handed with it, you know, as much as I can. So you know, you'll like that chapter, maybe, chapter 15. Uh, you haven't read it yet. Roger got an early copy, so I don't think he's got that far yet, but uh, I don't know, maybe he has. Uh, other people are welcome to look, edit it if you want. I'm always looking for Margot. When it actually comes out, where can people go to buy it? I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> um, I'll try to get it into the book nook. Uh, we can certainly sell it at the talks that I give. Uh, I have a few other books back there if you want to look at them. I only brought a few. I don't try to really push my work on other people, but if they want them, I'll be happy to sell. So we'll, uh, uh, we'll have, my sister has a shop over in, uh, here in, in Montague, and uh, we'll have some there. I don't have a license to sell uh, books, so I do it very seldom. Um, don't tell anybody, I'll probably get in all kinds of trouble. So any other questions, I'll be happy. I know I'm w well over time. Are there any other questions before, I'll, I'll stick around to kibitz with people. Oh, way in the back, I can't see very well. Start, started, it's in the, the last of the book, I think probably 25 or 26, and it ended during World War II. So they ceased operations in about 1942. Uh, if you look at the, toward the last page, there'll be a date of uh, beginning when they began. I'm gonna say maybe 25, 26. It wouldn't have made any sense before they were paved, the roads were paved. Did I say, did I say 26? 28. 28, all right. Okay. It was a really good operation. I mean, uh, what are you gonna do if you're on one side of the lake and you didn't have your dog paddles with you and, uh, to get across? I mean, then you had a car. I mean, you'd be willing to pay the 10 cents, right? To, to have somebody take you across. Well, this is kind of fun. Other questions? I'm looking around here. All right. Well, I'll be here for a while if you have others. Be happy to answer them. And thank you for setting things up. Uh, very memorable. Thank you.